Uh, chapter 38. <clears throat> then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. I want to uh, uh, say a, a word about gird up your loins. That's not a common phrase that we use today. So I want to make sure what everybody that everybody knows what that is. Back in those times, they used to wear long flowing robes. The problem is that when they were running into battle, you can't run well with the long robe on. So they used to tie the uh, bottom of their robe up around their thighs. It would look like they were wearing shorts and then their legs would be free to move. So that's what it means. Gird up your loins means get ready for action, get ready for battle. So God continues with verse in verse four. <laughs> Where are you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched the line upon it? Measuring line, that is. On what were its bases sunk or who laid its cornerstone? Now, at this point, I'm going to pull in another verse from later in the chapter, verse 38. When the dust runs into a mass and the clods cling together. In other words, it's when the, the earth became solid. This is another case of a scribe copying. And when he gets almost through the page, he discovers that he left out a verse. So rather than starting over again, he just puts in the verse wherever he happens to be. So verse 38 belongs between verses 6 and 7, according to Greenstein. Verse seven, when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Verse eight, or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far you shall come and no, far, no farther and here shall your proud waves be stopped. Verse 12, have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place so that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? Um, let me say a word about this verse. The image here is of a bed with a blanket on it. Now overnight, bugs may crawl up onto the blanket so you would lift up the blanket by the corners and shake it to shake the bugs out. So the image is shaking the wicked out of, uh, out of the earth. 14, it is changed like clay under the seal and it is dyed like a garment. Um, you know, when you're using sealing wax, you drip the sealing wax on the envelope and put the seal down on it. When you lift up the seal, there's the image has been pressed into the wax. That's uh, what it's saying here. The earth is changed like clay into the seal. Light is withheld from the wicked and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all of this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light and where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory and that you may discern the paths to its home? Surely you know, for you were born then and the great and great and the number of your days is great. God is being sarcastic here. Well, surely you must know you were around when the world was created, weren't you? Sarcasm. 22, have you entered the storehouses of the snow and have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cut a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no one lives? on the desert, which is empty of human life, to satisfy the waste and desolate land 
and to make the ground put forth grass. Verse 28, as the reign of father, who has begotten the drops of dew from whose, from whose womb did the ice come forth and who has given birth to the hoarfrost of heaven. The waters become hard like stone and the face of the deep is frozen. Verse 31, now he's gonna talk about constellations in the sky. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Uh, back then, it was thought that the stars of a constellation were held together by uh, uh, chains or cords. That's what the, the, the reference is here. Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? Uh, that means the constellations. Or can you guide the bear with its children? The bear is a constellation. Uh, you know it is Ursa Major, the great bear, and Ursa Minor, the little bear. Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightning so that they may go and so that they may go and say to you, here we are? In other words, the lightning says, yes, master, here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? This is a difficult verse in the Hebrew. Uh, Greenstein uh, translates this with a couple of birds. It, later on in, uh, in, in chapter 39, um, the author is going to talk about an ostrich as a very stupid bird. Um, Greenstein says here, there are the, this verse is about two smart birds. Who has put wisdom in the ibis bird? or given understanding to the rooster. The ibis plucks its food from under the ground. And of course, a rooster recognizes when the dawn is coming. So it's very, uh, the, the examples of the smart birds. Who has the wisdom to number the clouds or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens? So I'll skip verse 38, because we put it earlier. 39, can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? Chapter 39, God continues. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you number the months that they, are, that they fulfill? In other words, how, how long is their gestation period? How, how, how long is, are they pregnant? And do you know the time when they give birth, when they crouch to give birth to their offspring and are delivered of their young? Their young ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go forth and do not return to them. Who has let the wild ass go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift ass to which I have given the step for its home? the salt land for its dwelling place. It scorns the tumult of the city. It does not hear the shouts of the driver. It ranges the mountains as its pasture. It searches after every being thing. So he's, he's asking Job, can, can you command these animals? Verse nine, is the wild ox willing to serve you? I'm going to um, skip down in the interest of time. Verse 13, the ostrich's wings flap wildly, though its pinions lack plumage. Greenstein has this, do the ostrich's wings flap wildly? Question. Does it fly like the stork and the falcon? For it leaves its eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that a wild animal may trample them. The ostrich is being described as a, 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 a rather stupid bird. 16, it deals cruelly with its young as if they were not its own. Though its labor should be in vain, yet it has no fear because God has made it forget wisdom and give it, given it no share in understanding. When it spreads its plumes aloft, it laughs at the horse and its rider. Uh, my goodness, what might that mean? Uh, Greenstein translates the first phrase 
yet it can speed in a run. It's very fast. Scorning the horse and its rider. Uh, apparently an ostrich can run faster than a horse under with short distances. Of course, it, it doesn't have the endurance of a horse, but if the race is short enough, an ostrich would win against a horse. Speaking of a horse, verse 19, do you give the horse its might? Do you clothe its neck with mane? Do you make it leap like the locust? Its majestic, majestic snorting is terrible. It paws violently, exults mightily. It goes out to meet the weapons. So this is apparently a war horse that's being described. It laugh, laughs at fear and is not dismayed. It does not turn back from the sword. Upon it rattled the quiver, the flashing spear, and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, it swallows the ground. There's a, an image running so fast, it gulps up the ground ahead of it. It shall not stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, it says, aha, or hurrah, as Greenstein has it. From a distance, it smells the battle, the thunder of the captains, and the shouting. Now more about birds in verse 26. Is it by your wisdom that the hawk soars and spreads its wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up? This may be vulture, as we'll see in a few verses here, uh, and makes its nest on high. It lives on the rock and makes its home in the fastness of the rocky prey. From there, it spies the prey. Its eyes see it from far away. Its young men suck up blood. And where the slain are, there it is. That's why I think it might be bold. <clears throat> Chapter 40. And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Anyone who argues with God must respond. So Job responds. This is the end of, of, uh, of God's first discourse. And, and the following verses here are Job's first answer. Then Job answered the Lord, See, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. So Job is, uh, feels very small after this, this speech of God's. Now God's uh, second discourse, verse, starting with verse six. <clears throat> then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you declare to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Deck yourself with majesty and dignity. Close you, clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on all who are proud and abase them. Look on all who are proud and bring them low. Tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then I will also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can give you victory. Now God's going to talk about two primeval beasts or monsters. One's called Behemoth and the other's called Leviathan. <clears throat> God seems to be quite proud of these two monsters that God has created. Verse 15, look at Behemoth, which I made just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. Its strength is in its loins and its power in the muscles of its belly. It makes its tail stiff like a cedar and the sinews of its thighs are knit together. Its bones are tubes of bronze and its limbs like bars of iron. It is the first of the great acts of God. Only its maker can approach it with the sword. For the mountains yield food for it where all the wild animals play. Under the lotus plant, it lies. Uh, Greenstein has thorn bush, thorn bushes. Under the thorn bushes, it lies in the, in the covert of the reeds and in the marsh. 
The thorn bushes cover it for shade, the willows of the wadi surround it. The wadi is a small stream. Even if the river is turbulent, it is not frightened. It is confident, though Jordan rushes against its mouth. Can one take it with hooks or pierce its nose with a snare? Now we switch to talking about Leviathan, the sea monster. Chapter 41. Oh, by the way, the, um, the Hebrew Bible has the verse numberings a little bit different, just FYI. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, this verse is, uh, it continues, the chapter 40 continues. This is verse, verse 25 in chapter 40. And it runs up to uh, verse, what we have is verse eight, is the last chapter, is the last verse of chapter 40 in the Hebrew Bible. But we'll use our numbering here. Uh, 41 verse one, can you draw out Leviathan with the fish hook or press down its tongue with the cord? Can you put a rope in its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Putting a rope around its nose uh, refers to uh, tying its jaws together, tying its mouth shut. Will it make many supplications to you? Will it speak soft words to you? Will it make a covenant with you to be taken as your servant forever? Will you play with it as with a bird or will you put a leash on, put it, put it on a leash for your girls? Will traders bargain over it? Will they divide it up among the merchants? Can you fill its skin with harpoons or its head with fishing spears? Lay hands on it, think of the battle. You will not do it again. So he's warning Job, if you, if you touch it, you'll never touch it again. That'll be the last time. No one is so fierce as to dare to stir it up. Who can stand before it? Who can confront it and be safe under the whole heaven? Who? God seems to be quite proud of this beast that God has made. In verse 12, I will not keep silent concerning its limbs or its mighty strength or its splendid frame. Who can strip off its outer garment? Who can penetrate its double coat of mail? In other words, armor. Who can open the doors of its face? That's a very poetic way of saying jaws, the doors of its face. There is terror all around its teeth. Its back is made of shields in rows, shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined to one another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. Its sneezes flash forth light, and its eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. The eyelids of the dawn is a poetic phrase that means the glimmer, the orange glimmer of the dawn before the sun comes up. So its eyes have a, have a glow. From its mouth go flaming torches, sparks of fire leap out. Out of its nostrils come smoke as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. Its breath kindles coals and a flame comes out of its mouth. Sounds like, like a dragon, doesn't it? Like a, uh, a dragon. Um, in its neck abides strength and terror dances before it, or power runs before it. The folds of its flesh cling together. It is firmly cast and immovable. Its heart is, its heart is as hard as stone, as hard as the lower millstone. When it raises itself up, the gods are afraid. At the crashing, they are beside themselves. Though the sword reaches it, it does not avail, nor does the spear, the dart, or the javelin. It counts iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make it flee. Sling stones for it are turned to chaff. Clubs are counted as chaff. It laughs at the rattle of javelins. Its underparts are like sharp potsherds. It spreads itself like a threshing sledge on the mire. It makes the deep, 
boil like a pot. It makes the sea like a pot of ointment. That requires some, an explanation. Ointments are made by pharmacists. If when a pharmacist uses a mortar and pestle to mix something, right, the mixture swirls around in the mortar. So, so this means it makes the sea uh, swirl like mixture in a, mor in a mortar. It leaves a shining wake behind it. One would think the deep to be white haired. Ever seen a body of water when it's very windy? has white caps all over it, right? That's what this means. You would think the deep to be white haired. On earth, it has no equal, a creature without fear. It surveys everything that is lofty. It is king over all that are proud. The king of beasts is this monster Leviathan. God seems to certainly to be proud of these the monsters that have been created. Um, God is talking more about, about wielding power than a, about addressing Job's concerns. So now we get to a very tricky part uh, in chapter 42, where at the last chapter here, Job is going to answer the Lord. Now the question is, if you take this last speech of Job at face value, it seems to be a, con a confession and a repentance. Now, sharp curve here. That's what uh, Professor Pope feels. Professor Greenstein thinks that this speech of Job is sarcastic. It's not a real confession at all. So let's read through it and see what you think. I'm not going to decide for you. I, these, two got, the, these two professors have spent their entire career studying things like this, and I, I certainly haven't. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to present both points of view, and then it's over to you uh, as to what you think is going on here. Chapter 42, then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Then Job quotes something God has said. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? That's a quote from God's speech. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Verse 4, quoting God again, hear and I will speak. I will question you and you declare to me. Verse 5, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. So Job is having an epiphany. Now, now I see for myself what you are like. Is that a compliment or the opposite of a compliment? Now I see for myself what you really are. <clears throat> uh, therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Greenstein has, therefore, I'm fed up. And I take pity on those who are in dust and ashes. So he's fed up with what, according to Greenstein now, Job is fed up with what a God has done, and he takes pity on those like himself who are languishing in dust and ashes. Or maybe Job is sincere, right? Maybe this is a sincere repentance. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Uh, now we move on to the epilogue. And there are even more surprises. Verse seven, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is, is kindled against you and against your two friends. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So God is agreeing with Job and saying that Job's three friends, what they have done is blame the victim. Right? One, I think one of one takeaway that we can that we can get out of the book of Job is that we 
have no way of understanding what is behind someone else's misfortune. So let us not blame the victim. We don't know the cause of someone's misfortune. So uh, verse eight, now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has done. So again, God says, Job was right all along. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the, Shuman, the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Verse 10, and the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. One of the, one of the reasons we might consider this as an admission of guilt by God is that twice as much could refer to a very common sentence that was pronounced against a thief, that the thief would give back to the victim double the amount that was stolen. God is apparently doing that here. Uh, whether or not we can take that as God's admission of guilt and God's repentance, I don't know. That's the problem with the interpretation of this section. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Uh, one of the things I think is interesting here is that there is no mention of the Satan in the epilogue as there was in the prologue. Uh, according to the epilogue, uh, this all came from God. The Satan is not mentioned. Um, and each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. He's in the lake of fire, I guess, Steve, right? Uh, maybe maybe he was cast down from heaven at this point. Yes. Hey, now we know exactly when it happened, right? <laughs> Not to synchronize Revelation with Job at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. So his, he has the same number of children that were killed in the, in the beginning. He has uh, seven sons and three daughters. Uh, I think it's fascinating that the, that the author says more, uh, more about the daughters here. He named the first Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third, Karen Hapuk. Jemima means dove in Hebrew. Keziah means the spice kasha or cinnamon. And Karen Hapuk is, that's complicated to explain, explain, explain. Literally, it means horn of eyeshadow. <laughs> You're going to say, what the heck is that? Uh, I guess. The women used to keep their makeup in those days in, in a horn. And this name, Karen Hapuk, means uh, horn of eyeshadow or horn of mascara or some kind of eye makeup. What weird things to name your daughters. Uh, verse 15, in all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. Now that's a little bit surprising too. It was not common to give daughters an inheritance. They were supposed to get married and their, that's where their money came from, from their husbands. Although it's not unknown, there are other places in, in the Old Testament where it talks about a daughter's inheritance, but uh, it was rather rare, rather rare to do that. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children's 
four generations, and Job died old and full of days. So we have come to the end. It is, I think it's fascinating that these commentators disagree on these chapters. Um, in the chapters leading up to 42, God could either be um, uh, proclaiming his power and saying Job has no right to question that, or uh, you could interpret this as God being sort of drunk on power, and Job calls him out on that, and then God admits his guilt, or it could be Job gives a legitimate confession and repentance, and then God restores uh, Job's fortunes to him. Uh, any thoughts that we're, we're at the end of the book now, any thoughts about these things or, or anything else that we have covered in this book? Well, it seems to me that if Job is, is repenting, is admitting his guilt and repenting, all he's admitting is that he knows as much as God because God goes on this big litany of, well, did you make the animals? Can you do the stars, you know? And so it seems to me that all Job is, is admitting to is that, no, I'm not as powerful as you. Okay, I get that. But I don't hear Job saying, I messed up, therefore all these horrible things happened to me, which was what his friends were trying to say, right? That's so a good only, point. That's the, only good sin, point. the only sin that he's admitting to is being equal with God, which, or which reminds me of the creation narratives. You know, the reason they got kicked out of the garden was because they thought they could know as much as God did. So right. this, this seems to be another story where the authors are pointing out that we humans are stupid <laughs> and, and can never know as much as God and shouldn't try even. Yeah. That, may be, that may be true, but for me, the ending is more a confirmation of Job's humanity you know, it's not like God is trying to create Job into a worm to crawl on the ground yeah. forever and ever. But rather, he does point out maybe his fault, or he humbles him somewhat, but he lifts him back up. And for me, that's that's a confirmation of his humanity. Uh -huh. well, God I, is confirming it. I also thought it was interesting that God didn't restore his fortunes until after Job had prayed for his friends. Huh. Yeah, and, and and I wonder what would have happened if Job had said, no, you know, who's been suffering here and you guys have been no help, go away. I mean, if that had been Job's response, I wonder if God would have still um, restored him because perhaps one of the points of this is the importance of community and praying for each other and helping each other. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, Pat, I, I, I think maybe it's just a word difference, but I was thinking when he repents, he repents for doubting God. You know, I mean, I, I agree with you. He didn't, yeah. he didn't do anything wrong in the beginning. So there's nothing to repent for there, but he, but he did question God like any of us would have done. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then seemed to me seemed to repent for that. So yeah, that's, that's probably better. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Job, Job wanted to bring a lawsuit. He, yeah. Job wanted to drag God into court, and and that and and you know maybe that's what he's re repenting of here. Yeah, there was no Supreme Court back then that he could pack. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also wondering: is the Leviathan? And the behemoth mentioned any place else in the Bible, or do you happen to know, or is that unique to this book? It, it's not unique to this book. Uh, I remember at least one of the Psalms in which uh, Leviathan is mentioned. Yeah, oh, Leviathan is, is it, 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 it's sort of a symbol of of chaos. I don't I, I don't know why God created Leviathan only to have to subdue the monster in the sea. Uh, well, that, my... fit, 
Go ahead, Pat. Sorry. Uh, that, that fits in with the whole being drunk on power thing. <laughs> Look, I can create this horrible beast and then I can control it. You can't control it, but I can. Right. So if, if that's the image of God that is being presented here is of some deity, it reminds me of some of the Greek gods that is all powerful and loves it. Um, it it's a different conception of what we typically think of as God. Yeah. But this it's consistent. Neither. I'm sorry, Pat, but this okay. is neither here nor there, but one of my Cannon Beach Bible camp friends say that Leviathan and the other behemoth are uh, replicas of dinosaurs, and this proves that mankind and dinosaurs existed at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Too much time on the seashore, I guess. <laughs> it, it was, it, 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 it's also been noted that um, I don't remember where I read this, but there's a theory that these um, mythical monsters had re real world origins, that somebody was from the Middle East, went to Africa and saw a hippopotamus, mm. and that was beh behemoth, and saw crocodiles in the Nile, and that became Leviathan. Or well, I have some practical. Maybe. Go ahead. Sorry, Larry. I'm just making a snide comment. Well, I have some practical questions from this. Uh, I have written down: When was a trumpet invented? When were pants invented? It seems to, be <laughs> <laughs> to wear pants that girth up your lower, yeah, you girth up your garments or something. And then, where does cinnamon come from? Isn't that Indonesia? Or I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, depending on the translation you read, it's either cinnamon or cassia, which is a related sweet spice. Yes, good, good questions. I have no idea. <laughs> well, I don't know when, now when trumpets, they're not like the valved trumpets like we have now, but there have been trumpets around since like forever. I mean, as soon as somebody figured out how to go into something, there was probably a trumpet. Because, the, the, I mean, that's all over old writings and, and so well, forth. Is this the Iron Age or the Bronze Age? Bronze? Whoa. Well, they, they, they used to make trumpets out of ram's horns. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Animals, OK. Uh, Paul, is, do I understand we're starting out with Job? saying I did nothing wrong I did nothing wrong I don't know what why this is happening and then it the conclusion is that he he drops that he drops the um it sort of drops his identity and says I am nothing um, and I realize God is all-powerful and it's all in his hands. I have no power. Um, um, I would, um, but what I would say about that is um, Job realized that if he did sin, his sin was trying to haul God into court to demand justice from God. Okay. God, I mean, God admits that Job was innocent to begin with, but Job got himself into some trouble by trying to demand that God deliver justice to him. And I think that's what he's repenting of here at the end. Not, not, he's not repenting for anything that may have caused his suffering, right? But he's repenting because he tried to, tried to demand something from God. Well, how do they square the what seems to be um, an unfair misfortune? I mean, once we as, as, assume that they're like once the it's like a detective story. Once the body's killed, you don't worry about how it was done. Okay, you're just all about the the evolution, but. Um, when I, when I was listening to you talk about uh, God's reply, it seems so 
uh, somebody else said, Mary or somebody says, it seems just so irrelevant. It's like, how, what has that got to do with him killing Job's children? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, I think probably I'm trying to, I'm trying to put a modern pastiche on it and it, and what we need is to look at this as a teaching story. Yeah, I think you make, I think you do make a good point. And uh, as I said, one interpretation of this is that God admits guilt for uh, putting all that suffering on Job. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if, if it's possible for God to, to be guilty, you know, that's a whole other theological question. Is that even possible? And, but yes, certainly our idea of God that we have today is very different than the idea of God that they had back then. Uh, in fact, in Greenstein's book, he doesn't translate the Hebrew words for God into God. He leaves it in the Hebrew. El or Eloah or Elohim, uh, Yahweh for the Lord, um, Shaddai for the Almighty. He, he, he uses, he keeps the names in Hebrew because he wants to emphasize that the, the idea of God that's presented in, in this book is not really the same as the idea we of God we have today. It, it differs a little bit. Steve, may I personalize this story a bit? by saying that my, my sister-in-law, Dana Meyer, her, she lost, she, her brother was one of the first people to die of COVID back, back last winter. And then her mother died yesterday or two days ago now. And so she can't have a funeral for her mother. And so I'm thinking of poor, my sister-in-law, Dana, you know, a perfectly nice person, but what a year she's had. I mean, not only, I mean, we all suffer from COVID, but she lost, you know, her brother, and now she, her mother dies, and she can't see her mother anymore. And I just, uh, she didn't do anything wrong, mm -hmm. but that's that's kind of like life, you know. Yeah. Maybe that's the point with Job, that he ex accepts that. Um, it's God's choice or something. I don't know. Well, I kind of like what Steve, Steve pointed out that if the one, if for me, the one thing to take out of this is bad things happen to good people and we don't know. In the, and it wasn't their fault. And it wasn't their fault. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, if we... Uh... If we try to blame the victim, maybe we'll have to offer up a burnt offering and ask somebody to pray for us, huh? That, that's what, that's what Job, Job's friends were accusing Job of, do, of bringing it on himself. And God said, nope, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good bottom line. God be uh, the glory, maybe. I wouldn't use this book of the Bible to introduce someone to my faith. Oh, <laughs> no, you know, no. Would you like to follow my God? <laughs> Maybe not this one. It's a, it's a very complicated book. Oh, before we leave, I want to read the first part of the pre preface from Greenstein's book. We talked about how this was, book is so complicated to translate. Uh, Greenstein writes, I often begin a course or a lecture on the biblical book of Job with a well-known quip. In the book of Psalms, there is no connection between one chapter and the next. In the book of Proverbs, there is no connection between one verse and the next. In the book of Job, there is no connection between one word and the next. Although there is not a little whimsy in this last assertion, there inheres in it a certain grain of truth. The Hebrew of Job, with its eccentric idiom, an often inscrutable text poses an extraordinary challenge to the scholar of difficult languages. That's what 
Greenstein has to say about this book. So it's not our fault that we can't figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm good with that. Yeah, and I mean, this, this guy has spent his career uh, studying the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, rather. He's Jewish. Anything else before we uh, call, it a, call it a day? Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you. Just, just, just a little uh, uh, adult ed preview. After Christmas, Jim Augustin is going to be teaching from the book of, of Mark, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, then Paul Navarre is giving a class during Lent uh, about church architecture. I think he will be covering, uh, focusing on the cathedrals in Europe. And then Carol, Carol Klingerhofer is on deck uh, then uh, after Easter to finish off the academic year. So just to put in a plug for more, more classes. Thank you all.